Hello there, my friends. Pastor Knopp here with Emmanuel Baptist Church, and I'm delighted to be bringing you this lesson called Transforming Truths from our friends at Striving Together Publications, and uh, it's by Brother Jim Shetler, and we're grateful to them for allowing us to do this series during the time of COVID, and uh, Lord willing, when we finish this series, uh, everything will be back to normal. That's our prayer, and uh, we're thankful for how the Lord has preserved and protected his people through this time, and some we know have been delivered to heaven, uh, but the Lord has kept his hand on all of his own, and we're thankful for that. And we found that uh, some things have worked out for our good through this in amazing ways, and so we're thankful for those things. But we're thankful to be able to bring this series to you. We're on Lesson 8 today, How to Please God, and our text is Hebrews 11, verse 6. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them there. If you have your lesson book, open to Lesson 8, and I'll tell you what those words are. You can fill in the blanks and take some notes. But I want you to take note of this because the title makes it sound very important, and it is, How Do We Please God? How is it possible for a person to believe God? What has God requested? What has He asked for? What has God required of you and me in order for Him to be pleased in us and we're thankful for the scripture that lets us know in hebrews 11 verse 6 we read this but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him and so as we look at our lesson if you'll open your book you'll notice there are some verses given to us right off the bat in Exodus chapter 14, verses 9 through 16. Now in this text, we're given an amazing story about the salvation of the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. And there's a lot of parallels to this for our deliverance uh, from the bondage of Satan and sin and the salvation that Christ purchased for us on the cross. As we look at the text You'll notice that the children of Israel are brought between a rock and a hard place. They're brought into an impossible situation. If they try to uh, wade through the sea, they'll be drowned and they'll lose everything. But if they don't keep going right behind them, hot on their heels are Pharaoh and his horsemen. And uh, they begin to, to groan and complain. And in Exodus 14 verse 13, Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show for you or show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. That's a pretty speech. The Lord's going to fight for you. You'll, you'll do nothing and God will bring deliverance. But in the very next verse... The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel. So apparently Moses, after he speaks to the children of Israel and encourages them to trust in the Lord, that the Lord is able and willing to deliver you from your enemies. He hasn't brought you this far just to let you perish in the sea. The Lord has, has brought you here so that he can reveal his power and reveal his salvation to you. And apparently he goes to the Lord and then he says, Lord... You know, what are you going to do? Make a way forward for us. And the Lord says, why are you talking to me? He says, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So he says, you just go forward. Why did you stop? What's keeping you from going the direction I've told you to go? He says, I've told you to walk this way. I've told you to follow this pathway. And the obvious answer is, well, there's a sea in front of us. There's, there's some kind of blockage. And the Lord, I just find it a little humorous the way he speaks. He says, why are you talking to me? Well, because there's an impossible situation here. No, you speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And then he tells Moses, but you lift up your rod and you know the rest of the story. He stretches out his hand. He lifts up his rod and the Lord sends a strong wind and it blows and it pushes the water back and it holds it in the water. Uh, the walls up on either side and the ground is dry and the children of Israel walk across the Red Sea on dry ground. And then Pharaoh's army, when they try to come through, they're drowned. So it's an awesome story. It's an amazing story. 
but it shows us that God had already promised deliverance and what he was looking for from the nation of Israel was that they would just trust him. There was an impossible situation. They were thrust into an impossible scenario. Deliverance uh, just seemed impossible and it was for them, but it wasn't impossible for God. God said, just go forward. You go forward. In other words, he was calling the children of Israel to faith, to have trust that God is going to do what he has said he will do. Will you walk in faith? And we're reminded without faith, it's impossible to please him. So let's look at our points here. The first one, number one, and this is very important if we're going to know what faith is, it is a description of faith. If we're going to Please the Lord, we must have faith. And if we're going to have faith, we need to know what it is. Letter A under this uh, is true faith has confidence. And I think we could even say true faith is confidence. Now, it's not this kind of confidence that God is going to do whatever I want him to do. It's not a confidence that God can do anything. Um, the, the confidence that faith is, is not that God can do anything or that God will do anything. The confidence that believers are called to have is that God will do what he has said he will do. It's confidence in what God has promised, in what God has claimed. And we find the claims and the promises of God in the scripture and so we look to the bible and say well what is it that god has said he will do and that's what i'm going to have confidence in that god will do what he has said he will do some people wrongly mislabel uh foolish behavior as faith well i'm going to do this and god is going to you know take care of me and i might make a foolish investment and and god's going to give me back 10 times what I invest because, you know, God, God can do anything. Well, that, that's foolish. God has plainly spoken in his word the things that he will do. And it's the impetus then is on us to search the scripture, to know the mind and the heart of God, and then to pursue him by faith, trusting that he's going to do what he said he will do. It's confidence. That's what faith is. There was a man, one of my missionary heroes, named John Payton. And John Payton was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands. And a lot of his work you can still see there today, from what I'm told. I've never been there, though I'd love to go. It's now known as Vanuatu. But there's a well there that he dug, and you could still go and drink the, drink the cold, refreshing water from the well that John Payton dug. His story is amazing. His, his uh, work there was amazing, but one of, the, one of the great things that I have learned from John Payton was this life of faith. And you can read just about anything that he's done or experienced, and you'll see he did live by faith. But um, he, he was trying to translate the Scripture into their language, and he was looking for a word for faith. And he did not have this word. Well, you know, they didn't, they didn't have this word faith in their language and so he's trying to translate the scripture and he's coming to passages like hebrews eleven six and others but without faith it is impossible to please him and he's saying boy how do i how do i help them understand faith and so there's several options obviously that would be available to a translator but he's praying for wisdom and one day a messenger came and he had come running with this message for brother peyton and when he gets in there and he delivers the message he says can i recline on your couch and uh, John Payton says, certainly, go ahead. And he throws himself down onto the furniture and he kicks his feet up and he's, he's laying there on his pallet. And he says, ah, and he uses this word in his language for resting my whole weight on something. And when he puts his feet up, he says, I'm resting my whole weight on this piece of furniture. And he's talking about how good it felt for all of his weight to be on that furniture and uh, brother Peyton jumps to his feet as the story goes and he says I've got it that's my word the word for putting all of my weight onto something and true faith puts all of our weight onto God and most specifically 
the character and the promises of God. The God who cannot lie has said he will do this, and so I will function in such a way that says, if God does not make good on his promises, I will have egg on my face, possibly even drown in the sea, right? Don't talk to me. You talk to them and tell them to go forward. Put your confidence in the promises of God. Letter B, true faith produces change. And this is a reality that when someone trusts Christ, they will not stay the same faith functions in a life that brings about true change and you know that as well as i do when you believe something it affects your behavior when you are thinking a certain way it's going to affect the way that you live faith is not a work it's actually the opposite it is you trusting in the works of christ and you trusting in the merits of Christ and understanding that you have because of Christ a close relationship to the Father and now you can talk to him you can walk with him you can be free to live in a way that's pleasing to him to know and to do his will that's an awesome thing and it's going to produce a changed life without a doubt uh, the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth if any man be in Christ he is a new creature Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then letter C, true faith demands commitment. And there's no doubt about this. Uh, the life that Christ calls his people to is a committed life. And if you believe what the scripture teaches us about God, and if you believe what the scripture teaches us about God, us, then you're going to understand there's nothing else more important going on in the world beside you and your relation, your connection to the Father. There's nothing more important. And so I don't understand, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I've told you this story here on, on these videos, but I know I've shared it somewhere else. Uh, I, I think it was somewhere else, <laughs> but we were at dinner with some friends the other day and we'd gone and and um, we we met this gentleman and and um, we we asked if we could pray for him. And and then uh, at the end of the meal, the guy I was with handed him a gospel tract and he said, oh, thank you so much. He goes, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian. He said, actually, I'm, I'm a leader in a youth group. Oh, that's great. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, I haven't been there in several years, he said. And like, oh, okay. So not sure exactly what he meant, but he said, you know, they meet on Wednesday night, and I have to work. And so I can't really be a part of that. And, and at the time, it just made sense. People talk that way all the time, you know. They're just, well, I'm busy and, you know, okay, okay. So he said, well, we'll pray for you and uh, give you something to read. And if you are a Christian, pass along with someone else, encourage you to be faithful to Christ, that kind of thing. That was just how it went, and, and that was the end of it. But then the next day when I was thinking about it, and I don't want to be too hard on this young man. I, I know he was sincere, but what kind of a, what kind of a God is that who, who can grasp our attention for a time and then just kind of be put on the shelf while we pursue a relationship or pursue a career or pursue finances or an education or anything like that. And I thought, what, what kind of a God is that? Is that the God of the Bible? Is that, is that the picture that, that, the, that the Scripture gives to us of God? That, boy, God is really up here and, and He's just absolutely amazing. I mean, He's almost as good as my girlfriend. He, he's almost as cool as, as, you know, making $100 in a night. God's almost as, I mean, what, is that even the God of the Bible? And I'm thinking, oh man, have we even met this God? If, if his competition is a job serving cheeseburgers, have we even met this God? I, I, don't, I don't know. But I do know in my own life, there's always a temptation to complacency. And, and the way to avoid that is to, 
to meet with God. And I was reading recently, and I don't remember where. I wrote it down here in my notes, but I don't remember where I, who I'd read it from. This is an original with me uh, or with, with Brother Shetler. But um, there are two poles from which a knowledge of God always moves. And, and it's fascinating because we see this in people who meet God. In one moment, there is awe. And in the next, there's intimacy. And that's what worship is. Worship is never stagnant or complacent because it's constantly moving between these two poles. The God who made the universe, the God who is surrounded by angels who shout, holy, holy, holy. The God who... Uh, who, who upholds all things with the word of his power the God who made all of this and holds it up and who governs the nations according to the psalmist this God who we just stand in awe of is the same God that says call me Abba call me your father come to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so we're constantly shifting in worship between awe and intimacy. And it's an amazing thing. And when we're worshiping God, when we're viewing God, when we're seeing Him for who He is, we're, we're constantly shifting between these two poles of awe and intimacy. And I guarantee you there will be no complacency. This is what creates the true commitment in us. You know, when Jesus says in Luke 9, 23 and 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Jesus calls us to mimic his example. Take up our cross daily and follow after him. He's the cross bearer. He's the first. He's the best. He, he's, he's the one who did it for us. And now he says, now you do it for me, right? So he sets the example and we're called to follow in his steps. But his example was not grumbling. I can't believe I got to bear this cross. Oh, this is the worst thing. I would so much rather be doing fill in the blank. The Bible says it was joy. He endured the pain, but it was a joy set before him in doing the will of God. How can we find that same joy in our Christian commitment? It's through worship. And that is the life of faith. Uh, let's go on to our second point. I, I must hurry. But our second point is this. The word is daily. A daily forecast. So we have the, uh, the description of what faith is. And now we move on to this idea of taking up our cross daily and following after Christ. And that's how often these, uh, this faith life must be lived. There's no days off. There's no vacation away from trusting in the Lord and living and walking by faith. Let's look at this letter A. Every day there must be a step of faith. It sparked the Reformation, Romans 1, verse 17. The just shall live by faith. And so we're called in every scenario, in every situation, whether it's a witnessing opportunity or doing something for the Lord uh, that's obviously for Him or doing something that may not, you may not see it immediately as being for Him. I know it's hard sometimes when you're changing diapers all day or washing dishes, or driving in nails, or even just stopping on the side of the road to help someone who's broken down. It's hard sometimes to see the Lord in all of that, but we're called to do everything that we do by faith. And I believe that every scenario we find ourselves in requires faith. Faith is not just the first step. It's not just getting into uh, the family of God. It's not just for salvation it is for salvation but it is the first step of walking a life of faith and living by faith all right letter b every day there will be opportunities and there will be many opportunities uh brother star some of you know brother brian star he talks about these divine appointments and, and you know what those are and i know what those are it's where God brings along an opportunity 
to minister, to meet a need, or to serve, or often there's an opportunity to do good, or there's an opportunity to escape from an evil that pops up. There's a temptation, or there's some kind of, of issue, and so there might be a good thing that we're called to do, and there might be some evil thing that we're called to escape and avoid, and the reality is both of these are opportunities for us to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit, to be sensitive to Him, and to walk by faith, whether in our deeds of commission or our deeds of omission, that is, doing the good and rejecting the evil, we're called to walk by faith in every opportunity. And the reality is, is because God grants to us faith, it's a generous gift that comes through hearing the Word of God. This is what the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans chapter 10. When we hear the Word of God, we are given faith. And that faith which comes by hearing the Word is a blessing. And it has to be acted upon. It has to be exercised. And so we put our faith in the Lord and that's a wonderful thing, but the reality is so many times when we fail, we want to blame circumstances or maybe we want to blame God. But the reality is, is that God has given to us faith to obey him in every situation. The Bible says he's faithful to give us a way of escape from every temptation, right? So God's not to blame. Our circumstances aren't to blame. These things are opportunities by which you and I can trust Christ and believe that what he has said is best. So if God says it's best to do this, we do it. God says it's best to escape this, we escape it. We trust him, not what our heart tells us, not what the culture tells us. Let's not put the blame anywhere than where it belongs when we sin. It's because we have choose to believe someone other than God. And all of our failures are really faith failures because we fail to believe what God has said and then to act upon it. And then letter C, every day there must be an attribute needed. And you look at our text. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So look, I have to come to God believing that he has something I need. And I have to believe that I can only get it from him. So this is how we seek the Lord and this is how we please him. It's by going to him saying, Lord, for my life today, there are things that I must have and I can't get them anywhere else. And so I come to you because I believe you are a rewarder of me if I diligently seek after you. So these aren't in your book, but I'll give you a couple things. And I think these will help you. Some of the attributes that God gives to his people when we seek him and say, I have to get this from you or else I won't have it at all. And here's the first one. And if you write this down in your book or somewhere wherever you're taking your notes, we need God's wisdom. And I think you have these verses in your textbook, James 1, verses 5 and 6. Listen to this promise. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And you notice this. It says, God gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. That means he doesn't demean you. Say, oh, you need, what, you can't figure this out? You need wisdom? You, you need help from me? What's wrong with you? I, I can't believe you can't sort this out yourself. No, no, no. When we go to God and say, Lord, I don't know what to do in this situation, God gives wisdom generously, lavishly. He pours it out. I mean, it's like just, opening the floodgates and he doesn't say ah you should have been able to handle this yourself god does not function that way he doesn't upbraid his people he pours out wisdom on us but then he says but you have to ask for it in faith and the very next verse is amazing 
because it talks about this wavering man, this man who says, well, you know, I believe God can, but he's wavering. Uh, maybe he can't. You know, I have to hedge my bets. Sure, God could give me wisdom, but, you know, I need to see what Dr. Phil says or I need to see what Oprah says or, I need, you know, whoever else, uh, you know, Sean Hannity. I, I need to find out what what this guy or this lady is telling me, or maybe my grandma or maybe my grandpa. Look, we should all seek wise and godly counsel but we should expect that the wisdom comes from above and so we're seeking people who we know pray and trust the lord because we say i want wisdom from god because that's the only place i'm going to get it and sometimes god gives it to this person to give it to me and so i'll seek their counsel but only because i believe that they're going to get wisdom from god right so this wavering is not a man who seeks counselors. This wavering is a man who seeks ungodly counselors or he seeks people who do not walk by faith and seek the wisdom which is from above. But he says in verse 7, James the less says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So on the one hand, lavish wisdom, pour it out. On the other hand, nothing. So there's no halfway point for the wisdom of God. Either you get it, or you don't look you have situations today i can say with absolute authority because it's every day for every one of us but you have some uh, situations today that you need the wisdom of god you need to know what god wants you to do and if you don't get wisdom from god then you're going to make the wrong choice you can mark it down out of the nearly infinite choices that a person can make one of them is the wisdom of God. And that's the one you need. So it's all or it's nothing. This is the attribute you need, wisdom. Here's another one. We need God's power. Here's a verse from your, uh, from your notebook. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, you have that one too. They bring the man with the, who's sick of the palsy. And uh, Jesus saw their faith. He saw the faith of the man's friends. And what did he do? He healed the man. And th our faith unlocks the wisdom of God, but it also unlocks the working of God. And God gives his power he works on behalf. He shows himself strong on behalf of those who trust in him. There's another one here, Matthew 17, verses 14 through 20. We won't read it all, but the disciples couldn't cast out the devil from this demon-possessed person. And, and they ask him in Matthew 17, verse 19, why could not we cast him out? And what does Jesus say to them? Because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. So our faith invokes the wisdom and the working of God. Here's a third attribute. Write this down. I'll try to be quick, but we need his constant presence. Faith doesn't just invoke his power. It invokes the person. And when you get the person, you get the power and you get the wisdom that comes along with the person. Now, God is ever present. The psalmist teaches us that in Psalm 139 verses 7 through 12. But you don't always sense his presence. Faith does, though. Look, you may not always be able to feel the presence of God, but I believe that there's a reality to faith that says, I know God is here, and it makes a difference to me. I can sense him here. I remember as a young man, just as a teenager, I still remember it. I was a member of this church here, and I remember reading Psalm 139, and when the psalmist says, you know, the Lord has set himself uh, behind me and before me and around me and he's above me, he's below me, he's laid his hand upon me. And I remember maybe for the first time in my life, just as a young 16, 17 year old boy, recognizing the presence of God was with me. And that changed my life. But God was always there. He was always present. Uh, you're not going to escape his, his presence. You can't. He's all around us, but you could go without noticing it. Um, 
when the disciples, it was just providential when I was preparing this lesson, I'd been reading through Mark chapter 16. I was reading through the book of Mark and I got to verse 10 and it said that the, the disciples after three days, when when they came to tell the disciples that Jesus was risen, it said they were weeping and mourning. Three days later, still weeping, still mourning, they they sensed the absence of their Lord. And I was reminded of Samson, who when uh, when the men came in, it says, and he wist not that the spirit of God had gone from him. He didn't even know. He was so insensitive to the presence of God. And I want to ask you, what about you? Are you sensitive to his presence? Faith, faith trusts and faith senses, faith notices the presence of God. Letter D, and every day there must be a reward to gain. That's your blank, the word gain. And the scripture says he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So friends, by faith, diligently seek him and by faith believe that he rewards all right number three a diligent focus a diligent focus and it seems simple this uh faith life just trust god but anyone who has ever attempted to walk by faith and live by faith knows how subtle the world and the flesh and the devil knows how severe those temptations are those distractions are we know how hard everything just seems to be working against our confidence our trust in the lord everything seems to be shaped in such a way as to drive a wedge between the believer and his or her god so what do we need well we have to focus on this we have to work on this. Letter A, a decision to live by faith must be made. There has to be a determination. Rosaria Butterfield wrote an excellent book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And when I read that, I found out that she had several other books, and I, I started digging in those and reading through them, and they were very good, very helpful. I, I highly recommend her books. But one of the things that she said in there, and it, she said it just off the cuff, but you know how someone could be talking and they say something and it kind of makes a light bulb go off. She talked about how every day she seeks a place of repentance. Every morning, sitting at my kitchen table, I seek a place of repentance. And so she talks about the psalms that she sings and the scriptures she reads and the prayers she prays, all seeking a place of repentance. And she said, every morning, that's where I put myself, right there, seeking to be brought into right fellowship with the Lord and know that there's nothing between my soul and the Savior. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously I don't have it in front of me. But I wonder, do you make that determination? Have you made that decision where you say, I'm going to walk by faith? Look, there are a lot of people who want to walk by feelings. How does this make me feel? Do I feel good when I do this? Do I feel bad when I do this? If I feel good, I'll go after it. If it feels bad, I'll avoid it. A lot of people want to walk by fact. And they'll say, facts don't care about your feelings. And uh, they want to look at evidence, weigh the evidence. If I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if I can't feel it, then I, I don't believe in it and I, I'm going to live totally in a materialistic type of way and function by fact. But the truth is, walking by faith is a far superior way to live. Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the prophet says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it in proverbs chapter 3 we read we, we read trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths you see faith is better than following our heart faith is better than following our mind although it draws all of those things together faith is when i say what God has said 
is going to dictate the way I think, the way I view events and people and life and the world around me. What God has said is going to dictate the way that I feel about certain things that happen. You see, I don't stop thinking. I don't stop feeling. I don't cut one off and say, well, my feelings don't care about your facts or your facts don't care about my... I don't do that. I don't cut either one off. But I say all of those things, my mind, my emotions, my will, all of those things become the slave to what God has said. There's a man, one of our missionary heroes, named Jim Elliott, and uh, he wanted to be a missionary to Ecuador. And so he goes to college, and his, his, his determination doesn't waver at all, and he goes there for a very short time before he's killed. And I think most people would look at Mr. Elliott's life and say it, it was wasted. Why? Well, you can't argue with the facts. Well, I feel like he wasted his time. I feel like he wasted his uh, potential, right? But it wasn't a waste. He knew it wasn't a waste. He wrote in his diary not long before he passed away or before he was murdered, he wrote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And let's be honest. If God has lied to us, if God cannot be trusted, then sure, he wasted his life. But if God is true, if what God has said is true, then Jim Elliott is a blessed man, eternally blessed. And he was no fool because he gave what he couldn't keep to gain a reward he could never lose. So let's walk by faith, make that determination. Letter B, a desire to please him must be kept. You have to determine it. You have to make that decision. But there also has to be some consistency to it. You remember as we read not long ago in James 1 verse 7, he that wavereth, the double-minded man, of verse 8 in your notes, unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. When you go to God, go in faith. Don't let it waver. Letter C, lastly, a determination to hold on must be settled. So we're progressing here. The starting point, you say, I'm going to walk by faith. And then you hold to that. You want to be faithful. You want to be diligent. I'm going to continue to walk by faith. Oh, but then the storms of life come and everything just wants to, to knock you off course and knock you down and knock you out of the race and knock you out of the fight. Listen, hold on during those times. Faith reminds us that we are able to hold on to God because God is holding on to us. We are able to trust in Him because we're kept in His hand. But it's faith that sees that. It's faith that believes that. And the question is, are you trusting in the Lord? You say, well, I prayed a prayer. That's not what I'm asking. Are you trusting in the Lord? Are you trusting in the Lord to keep you eternally secure? Are you trusting in the Lord to keep you eternally happy? Are you trusting in the Lord to keep you safe and joyful and fulfilled today? You can tell by the things that disturb your peace. Those are the things you're tempted to trust in. Look, if you watch the news and you say, oh, the president is just tearing up our military, and, and he is. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And you say, we could be invaded very easily. Look at the, the military might of China. Look at the authority of Russia and the weakness of, of, of America. And all. I, there's, there's no doubt about those facts. There's no doubt about that. Does it disturb your peace? Does it rob you of your joy? When you look at your stocks or your 401k or your retirement or those things, do those steal your joy? Do they take away your, your sleep? Who is your comforter? Is it some human relationship? You see, in all of these things, we're being asked to examine what it is we're trusting that's going to make us 
happy, going to make us fulfilled, make us joyful, take away our pain, take away our sorrow, take away our, our, our troubled hearts. Jesus has come to do just that, to deliver to us the wholeness that Adam and Eve lost in the garden. And he says that we can have it if we'll come to him by faith, if we'll trust in him, if we'll have our confidence in him. And let me encourage you, when the road gets rough, because it will, I mean, it does, when, when you don't know what to do next, trust in Christ. Put your faith in the Lord. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Friends, let's diligently seek the Lord this week and may God richly bless you.